All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at a new sutra. We are still in the Majima Nikaya, so we're still in the middle length discourses. Um, we're going to skip over a few sutras from last week, and we're tonight we're going to be talking about sutta number 25, the uh, Nivapa Sutta, the bait. Um, so really quickly, let me kind of tell you how we came to be talking about this sutra tonight, or like why I chose it. So first thing to mention, and I don't think I mentioned this um, weeks and weeks ago when we first started looking at this collection. So there's about 150 suttas in this in this collection actually there's 152 but it's basically 150 because they're broken into what are called the root 50 like the the primary root 50 suttas and then the middle 50 and then the final 50 how we get to 152 well there's a couple extra in there but basically that's the the, the, the major division of this collection is 50 suttas, 50 suttas, 50 suttas. We're, of course, very much still in the roots, the uh, first 50 of the suttas. And then those 50, 50, 50, the first 50 suttas are divided into groups of 10. So there are five groups of 10. And the first group of 10 are suttas on the roots. So it makes sense. So the roots, and that's where we read like the root of all things. That's the first sutta in the collection. We read um, all the taints. That's another of the roots in that way. And I think ultimately we read four suttas from that first set of 10. Then we move to the second set of 10, which is the group of suttas on the lion's roar. And we, I haven't spoken too much about that idea of the lion's roar. I'll probably do a whole whole sutta, a whole class on it one night. But I think we did three suttas from the lion's roar section. And the last one that we did was the one you know from last week, which was the two kinds of thought, right? And when we were doing that last week, you may recall that part of that sutta was a simile. And it was the simile that the Buddha gave at the end about the person who wanted to trap the deer. And so they created a kind of a false path. They set up a dummy and they basically trapped the, the deer. And then the Buddha says, but then if somebody else comes along and shows the right path and gets rid of the dummy, then the, the deer can kind of be happy and free. And then he says, by the way, in my analogy or in my simile, the person who wants to get the deer and harm them is Mara. And the person who has opened the, the, the gates to the right path, that's the Buddha, that's the Dharma. And so it's from that simile that we move to tonight's sutta because tonight we're moving into the third set of 10. And so again, we're in sutta number 25 tonight. And the third group, so the third group of 10 suttas from the first 50 suttas are these 10 suttas on similes. So they are a group of similes, or they're a group of sutras in which the Buddha uses a simile. Now, you may notice that even the sutta from last week had a simile. Why isn't it in this section? Well, the Buddha always uses similes. What we're going to see is that the sutta tonight is exclusively a giant simile in that way. And that's why it's sort of in this section. So um, really quickly, actually, I, I'll, talk, I'll talk about this now as an introduction to the sutta. So the bait this idea of nivapa. 
so there seems to be a little bit of mm, debate or difference of opinion about how to exactly translate this sutta. And what I mean is, is that this sutta is basically about, it's about deer. It's about herds of deer, which is how we are connected to last week. But it's about someone putting down and the the verb to put down is to to vop in in Pali. And so it's about this nivapa, which is that which is cast down, the bait. And then the person who does that, the nivap, nivapiko, and it's a question about who's putting down the, the bait or who's putting down this nivapa. Some people seem to read this as that it's a it's about a farmer who is putting down seed to grow crops and these pesky deer keep getting in the crops and so the farmer doesn't want these deer around and so is going to in a way take measures to keep the deer away that seems to be one way people read this sutta and then there's sort of another way, which is the way that to me makes sense. It's the way that Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli seem to have interpreted it. And it's that the person, the nevapiko, the person who's putting down the bait, is trying to catch the deer, is a hunter. It's, it's not about growing crops. It's about catching deer. And as the sutta will say, and doing with them what we please. Now, I'll just kind of leave that out there for now. And then after I do the reading, we can discuss what you, what we all think, like which direction, what makes sense. To me, it's pretty clear. I will tell you this though, ahead of time. To me, it's pretty clear though, that this is about a deer trapper, like somebody who wants to trap deer. <laughs> And by the way, we are supported in that reading, or I, we are supported in that reading, because if you look at the Chinese versions of this sutta, they clearly describe it as a deer hunter and about catching deer. And that's what kind of the use or the value of, of seeing how these suttas were translated into other languages is we can see, oh, they understood it that way. That's helpful in our reading of it. So, all right. So I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, the sutta kind of, it's one of these beautiful ones that just speaks for itself. It, it kind of just says what it is here to say. We'll have plenty to talk about afterwards though. So, um, Kick back and relax and enjoy this reading of the Nivapa Sutta, the bait. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savatti in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus! Venerable sir, they replied. And the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus! A deer trapper does not lay down bait for a deer herd, intending thus, I hope this deer herd enjoys this bait that I, that I have laid down, and I hope they be long-lived and handsome and endure for a long time. N no, a deer trapper lays down bait for a deer herd, intending thus, the deer herd will eat food unwarily by going right in amongst the bait that I have laid down. By so doing, they will become intoxicated. When they are intoxicated, they will fall into negligence. When they are negligent, I can do with them as I like on account of this bait. Now, the deer of a first herd ate food unwarily by going right in amongst the bait that the deer trapper had laid down. By so doing, they became intoxicated. 
When they were intoxicated, they fell into negligence. When they were negligent, the deer trapper did with them as he liked on account of that bait. That is how the deer of the first herd failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Now, the deer of a second herd reckoned thus. The deer of that first herd, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Suppose we all together shun that bait food, shunning that fearful enjoyment. Let us go out into the forest wilds and live there. And they did so. But in the last month of the hot season, when all the grass and the water were used up, their bodies were reduced to extreme emaciation. With that, they lost their strength and energy. When they had lost their strength and energy, they returned to that same bait that the deer trapper had laid down. They ate the food unwarily by going right in amongst it. By so doing, they became intoxicated. When they were intoxicated, they fell into negligence. When they were negligent, the deer trapper did with them as he liked on account of that bait. And that is how the deer of the second herd also failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Now, the deer of a third herd reckoned thus. The deer of that first herd, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. The deer of that second herd, by reckoning how the deer of the first herd had failed and by planning and acting as they did with precaution and going to live in the forest wilds, they too also failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Suppose we make our dwelling place within range of the deer trapper's bait. Then, having done so, we shall eat food not unwarily and without going right in amongst the bait that the deer trapper has laid down. By doing so, we shall not become intoxicated. When we are not intoxicated, we shall not fall into negligence. When we are not negligent, the deer trapper shall not do with us as he likes on account of that bait. And they did so. But then the deer trapper and his followers, or and his following, considered thus, Woo! These deer of this third herd are as cunning and crafty as wizards and sorcerers. They eat the bait laid down without our knowing how they come and go. Suppose we have the bait that is laid down completely, suppose we have the bait that is laid down completely surround all around over a wide area with wicker hurdles, then perhaps we might see that third deer herd's dwelling place where they go hide. They did so, and they saw the third herd's dwelling place where they went to hide. And that's how the deer of the third herd also failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Now, the deer of a fourth herd reckon thus. The deer of that first herd, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. The deer of that second herd, by reckoning how the deer of the first herd had failed, and by planning and, and acting as they did with precaution and going to live in the forest wilds, they also failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. And the deer of that third herd, by reckoning how the deer of the first herd and also the deer of the second herd had failed, and by planning and acting as they did with precaution, or with the precaution of making their dwelling place within range of the deer trapper's bait, they too also failed to get free from the deer trapper's power and control. Suppose we make our dwelling place where the deer trapper and his following can't go. Then, having done so, we shall eat food not unwarily 
and without going in right in amongst the bait that the deer trapper has laid down. By doing so, we shall not become intoxicated. When we are not intoxicated, we shall not fall into negligence. When we are not negligent, the deer trapper shall not do with us as he likes on account of that bait. And they did so. But then the deer trapper and his following considered thus. These deer of this fourth herd are as cunning and crafty as wizards and sorcerers. They eat the bait laid down without our knowing how they come and go. Suppose we have the bait that is laid down completely surrounded all around over a wide area with wicker hurdles. Then perhaps we might see the fourth deer, fourth deer herd's dwelling place, where they go hide. Mar or the deer hunter and the followers did so. But they did not see the fourth deer herd's dwelling place. They didn't see where they went to hide. Then the deer hunter and his following considered thus. If we scare the fourth deer herd, being scared, they will alert the other deer herds. And so the deer herds will all desert this bait that we have laid down. Suppose we treat the fourth deer herd with indifference. And they did so. And that was how the deer of the fourth herd got free from the deer trapper's power and control. Bhikkhus, I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. Bait is a term for the five chords of sensual pleasure. The deer trapper is a term for Mara, the evil one. The deer trapper's following is a term for Mara's followers. The deer herd is a term for recluses and Brahmins. Now, recluses and Brahmins of the first kind ate food unwarily by going right in amongst the bait and the material things of the world that Mara had laid down. By doing so, they became intoxicated. When they were intoxicated, they fell into negligence. When they were negligent, Mara did with them as he liked on account of that bait and those material things of the world. That is how the recluses and Brahmins of the first kind failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins, I say, are just like the deer of that first herd. Now, recluses and Brahmins of the second kind reckoned thus. Those recluses and Brahmins of the first kind, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Suppose we altogether all shun that bait food and those material things of the world. Shunning that fearful enjoyment, let us go out into the forest wilds and live there. And they did so. There they were eaters of greens or millet or wild rice or hide parings or moss or rice bran or the discarded scum of boiled rice or sesium flour, or grass, or cow dung. They lived on forest roots and fruits. They fed on fallen fruit. But in the last month of the hot season, when the grass and the water were all used up, their bodies were reduced to extreme emaciation. With that, they lost their strength and energy. When they had lost their strength and energy, they lost their deliverance of mind. With the loss of their deliverance of mind, they returned to that same bait that Mara had laid down and those same material things of the world. They ate food unwarily by going right in amongst it. By so doing, they became intoxicated. When they were intoxicated, they fell into negligence. When they were negligent, Mara did with them as he liked on account of that bait and those material things of the world. That is how those recluses and Brahmins of the second kind failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins, I say, are just like the deer of the second herd. Now, 
Recluses and Brahmins of the third kind reckon thus. Those recluses and Brahmins of the first kind, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins of the second kind, by reckoning how the recluses and Brahmins of the first kind had failed, and then planning and acting as they did with the precaution of going to live in the forest wilds, also failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Suppose we make our dwelling place within range of that bait that Mara has laid down and those material things of the world. Then, having done so, we shall eat food not unwarily and without going right in amongst the bait that Mara has laid down and the material things of the world. By doing so, we shall not become intoxicated. When we are not intoxicated, we shall not fall into negligence. When we are not negligent, Mara shall not do with us as he likes, on account of that bait and those material things of the world. And they did so. But then they came to hold views such as these. The world is eternal, and the world is not eternal. And the world is finite, and the world is infinite, and the soul and the body are the same thing, and the soul is one thing and the body is another thing. And they also came up with the view that after death, a Tathagata exists, and the view that after death, a Tathagata does not exist, and that after death, a Tathagata both exist and does not exist, and that after death, a Tathagata, a Buddha, neither exists nor does not exist. That is how those recluses and Brahmins of the third kind failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins, I say, are just like the deer of the third herd. Now, recluses and Brahmins of the fourth kind reckoned thus. Those recluses and Brahmins of the first kind, by acting as they did without precaution, failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins of the second kind, by reckoning how the recluses and Brahmins of the first kind had failed, and by planning and acting as they did with the precaution of going to live in the forest wilds, also failed to get free from Mara's power and control. And the recluses and the Brahmins of the third kind, by reckoning how the recluses and Brahmins of the first kind and also the recluses and the Brahmins of the second kind had failed, and by planning and acting as they did, with the precaution of making their dwelling place within range of the bait of, that Mara had laid down and the material things of the world, they also failed to get free from Mara's power and control. Suppose we make our dwelling place where Mara and his following cannot go. Then having done so, we shall eat food not unwarily, and without going right in amongst the bait that Mara has laid down and the material things of the world. By doing so, we shall not become intoxicated. When we are not intoxicated, we shall not fall into negligence. When we are not negligent, Mara shall not do with us as he likes on account of that bait and those material things of the world. And they did so. And that is how those recluses and Brahmins of the fourth kind got free from Mara's power and control. Those recluses and Brahmins, I say, are just like the deer of the fourth herd. And where is it that Mara and his followers cannot go? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, 
with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, with the fading away as well as of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, they enter upon and abide in the third jhana, on account of which the noble ones say, one has a pleasant abiding, one who has equanimity and who is mindful. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, with the abandoning of both pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. Again, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. And the taints are destroyed through seeing with wisdom. This bhikkhu is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity, and to have crossed beyond attachment to the world. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. So, as usual, I'd like to start just with any comments, questions, ideas, anything that jumped out at anybody, any, like... Just anything to start or just to hear what's on anybody's mind? Yeah, Lane. I just really appreciated the way uh, the Buddha didn't make it sound easy. Because when we went into this, I was expecting there to be like, oh, the bad path and the good path. But it didn't do that. It was like escalating levels of a commitment or change but it was like oh even that's not good enough oh that won't get you there either oh, that you know just because it is hard work it is hard work like it's it's one of those easier said than done things and i appreciated the acknowledgement of that 
lovely. I too appreciate that about this sutra. It's kind of like the, the Buddhist version of the three little pigs, except what Lane said, which is that it's not as simple as like bad choice, bad choice, good choice. It It's a little more complicated than that indeed. So thanks for that comment, Lane. All right, well, let's let's start sort of at the top. Um, you know, so we've got these four similes for these four deer herds, right? And then the Buddha reveals that this is all a simile for practitioners, you know, what they call recluses and Brahmins, but, you know, practitioners. And then the deer hunter turns out is Mara. So... Let's actually begin with a quick a quick reminder or a quick discussion of Mara. We've encountered Mara before. In fact, we are encountering Mara all the time in that way. But in terms of our texts, we've, in, we've encountered Mara before. You know, Mara is sort of this, you know, what can you say about Mara? In Buddhism, Mara is kind of the devil. I guess, right? If you if we were going to use those kind of Judeo-Christian theologic ideas, then Mara's kind of the tempter. He's called the evil one. But I know that we've encountered Mara in Dharma Doors before. I know I've talked about Mara. And if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, if you've been reading suttas, you know that the Buddhists are very aware that Mara is a personification of something. So they don't believe in a devil being, running around, causing mayhem and all of that. No, what it is, is it's kind of helpful to know that the word Mara <laughs> means death. Like that's what Mara is, is like the specter of death. And so what the Buddhists do or what Buddhism does is, again, they personify that fear of dying. They personify that fear of mortality and they call it Mara. And then they use this kind of, well, this language of being tempted or, you know, cajoled by Mara. And of course, what we kind of need to think about is we, we kind of need to be thinking um, metaphorically in that way, where it's not about some evil person in a dark cloak coming to your door in the middle of the night. No, it's about you waking up in the middle of the night with anxiety and fear. And Mara has come to pay you a visit. Mara is cajoling you in the middle of the night, and not giving you a good night's sleep. So that's like the way the Buddhist would talk about it. That's the way the Buddhist might talk about the arising of fear, anxiety, stress, and so on. It's being kind of tempted by Mara in that sense. So that's Mara. One of the things that I will say, just because it's it's here, it's actually not here. I, I'll say this really quickly, just because it's in, it's very informative. So what happens is, is this, in the early suttas, such as these, Mara's all over the place. Mara, of course, is defeated by the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, but then the Mara is always kind of messing with the bhikkhus and all of that. But in the early suttas, there's really just Mara, death, coming to get you. But as Buddhism develops and kind of basically kind of uh, blossoms, I would say, or develops into the Mahayana, the figure of Mara becomes a little more complicated. And what happens in that is in the Mahayana tradition, they start talking about the four Maras, that there's four versions of Mara. One, and, and so this is where it gets complicated. One Mara 
is the Mara of the aggregates. And what that does is it turns you into Mara, or at least the five aggregates into Mara. And now you can see that you're in a re in a relationship with Mara if the Mara if Mara is the aggregates. But it doesn't stop there because there is also the Mara of the kleshas, the the afflictions, greed, anger, delusion. That's a Mara as well. And that's also an aspect of you in that way. Then there's the third Mara, which is the Lord of Death. And that's the one that sort of we're talking about. The one that we're sort of dealing with is the, the Mara that is death. And that Mara, by the way, is not actually so personal. It the the kleshas, the Mara of the of the afflictions is kind of personal. The Mara of the aggregates is very personal. The Mara of the Lord of Death is, you know, that's our mortality. So it's personal, but you know, not quite so personal in that way. And then there's the fourth Mara, which is called the the Deva Putra Mara, the the Godling Mara. And I've read a few different interpretations of this. One interpretation is the nice version where they actually try to say, no, but there's even like a nice version of Mara. And that Mara lives up in the heavens and you get to meet the nice Mara if you ever go to a heavenly realm. I've heard that version. It's reasonable. It's kind of this Mahayana compassion, even for Mara kind of a thing going on. However, there's another interpretation of the, the Deva Putra Mara, which is that's actually about our, our desire for bliss, our desire for heavenly realms. That's a temptation of Mara. And so they call that the fourth Mara. But again, it would depend on who you talk to. The only reason why I'm going into such detail about the four Maras is because I want to return quickly to the first two, the Mara of the aggregates, and then the Mara of the kleshas. Well, what happens is, is this, those Maras, well, actually what I should say is, is that what happens is, is this, as the Mahayana tradition begins to morph and develop into the Vajrayana tradition, so the even more developed, more blossomed form of Buddhism, right? Well, as you may know, or as I, I'm pretty sure you're aware, that third Vajrayana type of Buddhism is the type of Buddhism that moved its way up the Himalayas and kind of landed in the Tibetan plateau and became sort of the foundation of Tibetan Buddhism. In Tibetan, Mara, the idea of Mara, the word Mara, it gets sort of interpreted or translated as a kind of demon. So the word and the Maras, it becomes a demon. And then they're developed in the Vajrayana practices, they're developed methods for dealing with the Mara of the aggregates and the Mara of the afflictions. And those practices become known as feeding Mara. But of course, in the Tibetan tradition, this has become what is known as feeding your demons. And now this is a standard or one of many standard practices in certain Vajrayana lineages. And I just kind of want everybody to know that this idea of feeding your demons you know, it's not Buffy the Vampire Slayer and there's like demons and stuff. No, this is like Dharma. And we're talking about Mara. And then this kind of interesting way of looking at the aggregates and the clutches as Mara. And because I am Mara, or at least because a big chunk of this that I'm attached to is Mara, it's probably better for me to have a healthy, kind relationship with Mara and not a contentious relationship with Mara. And so the, the general 
mode of feeding the demons is that kind of reversal in that way of, or it, at least in some practices. But I just wanted everybody to know that the demons are Mara and we're going to talk more about Mara tonight. So any questions about Mara before we get to kind of the other deeper parts of the sutta? Pretty straightforward. Okay. So let's get then to our four kinds of Brahmins and recluses and kind of examine sort of in, in line with what Lane was talking about uh, or Lane's comment. Let's kind of look at each of these four. So, you know, the first kind of recluse and Brahmin who eats food unwarily goes right in amongst the bait of Mara and goes right in amongst the and what's the language we use again? The material things of the world. So one of the things that we should keep in mind about Brahmins and even a certain degree recluses, you know, so at the time of the Buddha in India, there appears to have been many groups of what we would call renunciants, right? People who have sort of renounced society, are pursuing a spiritual path. And one of those recluses, one of those renunciants is a, is a Brahmin. And in Indian culture, of course, Brahmins are sometimes even referred to as priests, right? And they're referred to as priests because they perform rites and rituals. That's like one of the things about what they do. And often Brahmins perform rituals for people in exchange for money and in exchange for property and in exchange for lots of stuff. And so what I'm getting at is, is that there is one way of being a Brahmin, like being a spiritual renunciant at the time of the Buddha, but you wouldn't really leave society. You would be directly among it basically soliciting your services be like anybody need a your cows how are your cows doing i can help you with your cows i can do a ritual make your cows milk and so there's a way in which that form of spirituality that is sort of pretending to move away from society but is utterly dependent upon society and totally in society that's the way i would think of this first group of Brahmins and recluses that go right in amongst the bait and and kind of un, unwearily just have this relationship with society in that way. Versus our second group of Brahmins and recluses, which is what I think we think of more often, or I know I think of more often, and that's the going out in the woods so going very far away from the bait, going very far away from the material things of the world. Now, what the Buddha sets up with his analogy for both the deer and the Brahmins and the recluses is that when they remove themselves so far from society, they both do well for a little while. But then the language is, is about how they become weak. Their bodies become weak. And then their, their, the, the language, I think it was about their, their mental, I forget exactly the language and I can't find it, but it was about their mental composure falling apart because they're weak and they're hungry. And so now they're weak and they're hungry. And in that last month of the hot season, they go right back into the city. They go right back into the bait and to the worldly things. Now, if you're like me, when I first read this sutra and we first started hearing about the third groups of Brahmins and recluses, I, of course, was thinking, oh, here we go. Middle path. This is going to be our middle path. And then, sure enough, they didn't go right in amongst the bait. But the third group of deer also didn't go all super far away from the bait. Just like the Brahmins and recluses, they didn't go directly again into the bait, 
of the world, but they also didn't completely flee the world. They were sort of like right at the edge so that they could kind of still get food that was um, basically like real food, not the bait. So they could kind of go get the real food, but avoid the bait and, and avoid becoming intoxicated with it. So again, if you're like me, you're thinking that's the middle path. That's That should be it, right? But then the Buddha does this interesting thing where indeed, the deer trapper and Mara, or but I like the language of the deer trapper. The deer trapper, upon seeing this third group, was like, that those are some clever deer, right? They're like wizards and sorcerers. They're so smart. So there is a kind of, I would say, like a tip of the hat to that third group that they are clever, that, that they are up to something good in a way. But then of course, what happens in the deer, in our simile, the deer hunter is like, wow, these are some smart deer. I know I'll put, I'll put the intoxicating bait everywhere. I'll surround them with it. And that way I can follow them to where they are hiding out and then I can get them. Let's spend a moment looking at the analogy, meaning like looking at what does that apply to for the Brahmins and the recluses? So our Brahmins and the recluses who were who were smart and kind of didn't get too close to the debate, didn't get too far away from it in that sense. But what happens to them is they start to hold views. And that is the, the that is the, the trap. That's the bait for these smart third group there. And so they develop these views such as the world is eternal or the world is not eternal or that the world is finite or the world is infinite. And then these others. So these are 10 views. There are 10 drishti. There are 10 ways of thinking that the Buddha definitely said are like wrong ways of thinking. And in Dharmador's past, we have definitely dealt with these. We talked about these. So let me just sort of deal with them as a whole. Yeah, let me just sort of deal with them as a whole, or at least in chunks. So this idea about developing a view that the world is eternal or the view that the world is not eternal or finite or infinite. So these ideas, of course, are part of what are called the two extreme views. The extreme view of eternalism and the extreme view of nihilism or what the Buddhists call annihilationism. And these views, the view of eternality or the view of nihility, are applied to either the world or the soul or the self, the Atman. And the idea is, is that we basically have, we got two options in a way. We, we don't, there's another option, but normally we think in two ways. And what it is, is, is that we sort of either think regarding the world or regarding the self, we either think that it's going to go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Or we think that there's a clock ticking and the world and ourself will at some point both fizzle, fizzle out and then not be anymore. And so Buddhism or the Buddha says that what I teach or what you know the dharma avoids those two extreme views but what i want us to think about is like and and i think this is always a good thought experiment it's sort of about noticing that our our mind does actually normally slip into one of those two extreme views and what i mean is is that 
you know, regarding the self, we could have one idea of basically like reincarnation, where this is just the body this time, but the real me is going to transcend this body and then enter a new body. And then after that, enter a new body. And then after that, enter a new body. And so the real me, the real me is eternal. It's just going to keep going from body to body to body to body. And it may happen actually that I just fully embody Brahma, <laughs> that I just kind of fully become God and then I'll really be eternal. But either way, there's one idea that I am going to just keep going on forever and ever and ever. Or in the more uh, kind of Judeo-Christian view, there's an idea that after this is over, I'm either going to heaven with God forever or I'm going to hell forever. But notice there's eternality of me in heaven or hell forever. Or if it's reincarnation, there's a real me forever. So there's that option. Or there's the scientific materialist option of a momentary coalescence of chemicals and what have you, and the eventual falling apart of those, and then no more you. And we could apply all of that, by the way, to the world. There's the idea maybe that the that the universe is just going to expand infinitely forever, eternally. And there's the view that it's all going to come to nothingness or back to a kind of, you know, it'll be destroyed. But even within that, there's a sense of recursion or that it's just going to happen again forever or it's not and it's done. But I, again, I just want to notice that the way we think is normally extreme, meaning it's we think either in terms of eternality or we think in terms of nility. The Buddha says, yeah, all of these questions about whether the world's eternal or finite or all of these questions, they're missing the entire point. And that's where really quickly we can come back to the idea of the self and this idea of me being eternal or me being finite and, and temporary. Well, this is where we realize, oh, the Buddha put a question mark on that me thing and basically asked, okay, well, what is that that you think might last forever or that is going to eventually go out of existence? What exactly is that self that you think is going to last forever or not? What is that? And that's where the Buddha real, revealed in a way, there isn't that. There isn't a self to be eternal or to not be eternal. We're thinking about it wrong. But that's what we've been talking about in Dharma Doors forever now. It's there isn't a self, but there is the being under the impression that there is a self. And I want to remind everybody, I know I do this every Sunday night, but I just feel like it's going to be that one time that there's either somebody new here or somebody new listening later. So I want to make it really clear when we're talking about this Buddhist idea of no self, what we are talking about again is not that you don't exist right now. No, you, hi, you're here. This is happening. This is really happening. And you're here. But what doesn't exist is you as a child. You're an adult, or I presume you're an adult. Everybody here is an adult. But you, this here, is not a child. But we have this idea of me when I was a child. That's the self that the Buddha is talking about that doesn't exist, is the me that was a child and is now an adult. And the question is, okay, what was a child 
and is now an adult. What? And I know that we want to say, well, <laughs> me, <laughs> I was a child. I was an adult. And this is where it's like, okay, but what are you referring to? If you're referring to the physical body, of course, this is the body <clears throat> of an adult. This is not a child's body. So you must be referring to what? The, the mind? And you have this idea that you're, you and your mind used to be a child? Really? Because the mind here has had a whole lifetime of experiences and has been molded by that lifetime of experiences and is that. You are that. So how could that have been a child? The child was the child doing the child things. And this isn't here now. But what happens is, is the, a weird clinging to both body and the child and the baby and the adolescent and the teenager. It's a clinging to all of it as self. And you know what that's not unlike? It's not unlike extending my sense of self and being like, I am this body. No, I am this body and my property. I am this body and my property and my, you know. And so you can have this sense of self that includes all this other stuff. But are you your clothes and your property? Are you your hands? What are you? And that's what <clears throat> we really just haven't thought much about. It's a, it's a presumption. And we just <clears throat> kind of roll with it. But the point is, is that if you realize that there isn't a time-based self, that was a child and is now an adult, if you recognize that, oh, there isn't that, there is just this presently arisen state of consciousness based on everything that is presently happening. That, this present state of consciousness, is neither eternal nor finite. That's what the big reveal is in Buddhism, is that there isn't that thing to be eternal or to not be eternal. We're thinking about it the wrong way. The beauty of this, by the way, and this is kind of getting to the end, I mean, like the end of the sutta and the point, but I want to remind you about Mara, whose name means death, and my description of Mara as like the specter of death. And what I want you to notice is that we just walked through it again where my fear of dying is my fear of going out of existence. But notice that that is based upon the idea of a me that then is at risk of going out of existence. And now Mara is sitting there going, <laughs> I got you. But the realization is, is, oh, if, there is just this presently arisen experience and there isn't that actual entity, Michael. There isn't anything to die. This body is going to decay and pass away. I, I, I guarantee you about that. It's just a matter of, are you the body that is going to decay? Many of us are associated with the body. In fact, that was the other thing the Buddha said <clears throat> uh, in his questions. It's the idea that the soul and the body are the same thing or that the soul is one thing and the body another thing. Those are views that are going to get you all messed up in that way. Versus this kind of realization that there just isn't that self that I thought about, that I was thinking about. And now all of a sudden, there isn't that thing to die. And now Mara has been defeated. Easier said than done, of course, in terms of attachment and clinging and all of that. But 
Okay, so that's our third group of recluses. And the point is, is that they were good practitioners, very kind of, you know, middle pathy where they were not getting intoxicated, but they are not, you know, super hardcore ascetics starving themselves out in the forest. But in that kind of Goldilocks zone in relationship to the bait, they started to develop these views. And that's how Mara trapped them. And then we come to the fourth group of deer and the fourth group of Brahmins and recluses. So I actually find the, the way that the, the original story of the deer, I find the way it plays out interesting. So the really smart deer of the fourth group, right? They say, let's just go somewhere else. Like, let's go where, they, where, where the deer hunter can't even find us. And so they do. And then again, the deer hunter is like, wow, this fourth group of deer, they're really smart, right? They're like wizards and sorcerers. And then they start trying to figure out a way to get the fourth group. And they say, and Mara, or sorry, the deer hunter says, all right, <clears throat> we could scare them to find out where they go and then find their hiding place. But then we would risk scaring all the other deer. And then we would basically lose all of our deer. So what happens is, is that the deer hunter just ignores the fourth group, just pay, is, is, is indifferent to them. And that's kind of an interesting way that that resolves. And what I want, what I want you to kind of be thinking about regarding that is in terms of Mara, the there's a there's a sutta maybe we'll i don't think it's in this collection though so i don't think i'll do it next week but there is a sutta where the buddha talks about defeating mara and it's a confusion that some of the monks have which is that that the buddha i mean i'm paraphrasing this but it's the idea that the buddha like destroyed mara but meaning that for the buddha Mara doesn't didn't exist anymore. And the Buddha's like, no, no, no. I, I see, I see Mara everywhere. Mara, Mara is here, is present, but there's a way in which Mara's ignoring me. And that's where how it relates to the the deer in that way. So it's it's not that this mortality in a sense, again, mortality of the physical body, we don't escape that. And that's where even the Buddha didn't get rid of that. But what a Buddha does do, though, is no longer identify, cling, and attach to anything. And that's how we get to, well, that's going to bring us to meditation and the jhanas and the samadhis. So that's kind of the idea. So the fourth group of Brahmins and recluses they say, let's go somewhere where Mara can't get us, right? Um, or where Mara and his followers can't go. And then the Buddha says, and where is it that Mara and his followers can't go? They can't go into the jhanas and the formless jhanas, the samadhis as they're called. So let's go through those. Um, I did want to do this sutta tonight because... The last few nights we have, uh, or it wasn't last time, but recently we've been dealing with the four jhanas, but we haven't lately dealt with the four, what are called the four formless jhanas. And so I wanted to do this sutta tonight because um, the Buddha goes through all eight of these. In fact, he goes through nine stages of meditative development. So let's walk through those real quick. But let's do this, though, being mindful that this is where Mara can't get you in that way. So where Mara can't go, of course, is into these geonic states. And I want to remind you, of course, what I was saying at the beginning. Mara is a personification. So we are not talking about some sci-fi fantasy where there's a devil being and there's secret meditative hideouts where Mara can't go. 
let's remember that Mara is sort of about desire, craving, fear, anxiety, stress, just all of the terrible emotions of the world. <laughs> where can we go <laughs> where there are not all the terrible emotions of the world, all the fear and the dread? Well, if we become quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, we could enter and abide in the first jhana. So, of course, to seclude ourselves from sensual pleasures, we've talked about it in many Dharma doors past, but of course, we're talking about, you know, not being stimulated. So, not listening to music, not watching TV, not eating food, not smelling flowers or something, um, not having intercourse, so the body, not touching other bodies in that way, not sort of in a way dealing with the body at all, and eventually even the mind, not even kind of entertaining thoughts of sensual pleasures. There's another requisite, though, for getting into a jhana, and that's being secluded from unwholesome states. So that, of course, is a statement about morality. You cannot, at least traditionally, technically, traditionally, technically, you cannot get into a jhanic state if you have told a bunch of lies, or if you're very violent, or if you've stolen stuff or if you're intoxicated, or basically if you're fornicating in that way, or at least if you're very, very sexually stimulated. Traditionally, that is, and it's, again, what I want to kind of, for me personally, my understanding of Buddhism, it's not that like these things, listening to music, watching TV, these things, it's not that they're evil or anything like that. They're just not compatible with jhana, with meditative states. Because a meditative state, we are working on calming the mind down and being satisfied with very little stimulation to the point where we're actually delighted with no stimulation. And it's from the actual, and, and remember the first jhana is all about the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. So it's that rapture and bliss that comes from actually not being in contact with things, giving it all a rest. And so that's what I mean by it. It's not that listening to music is bad. It's just not compatible with getting into a geonic state traditionally in that way. So if we can seclude ourselves from sensual pleasures, if we can seclude ourselves from unwholesome states, we could get into that first jhanic state, right? Which is accompanied by, and this is our lesson from last week, those two kinds of thinking. The, um, the paka, I think, I actually can't remember from last week, and vichaya. The two, Vitarka, Vitarka and Vichaya. So those are the two kinds of thinking that we talked about last week. Vitarka is looking around. And then once you see something and you're going to focus on it, that's Vichara. And so those are the two modes of thought, which they call applied and sustained thought. So in the first jhana, we are on the lookout for the arising of sensations, whether they be, you know, desire filled or not, what have you, but we're, we are on the lookout. And then if we notice the arising of a little bit of anger, we pay attention to it. We notice it. And that's the su sustained thought. So we notice it pop up. Oh, what's that? And then there's the sustained contemplation on it. And that is in the first jhana, which is accompanied by such ways of thinking. And of course, it's rapturously pleasant.
in that way. Now, the sutra introduces this interesting language that if you are in the first jhana, you've put a blindfold on Mara. You've become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eye of its opportunity. All right, so before we move on to the next few jhanas and then the formless ones, I want to take one quick step back to talk about this. So the language of this sutta, when it came to the deer, the Buddha kept talking about how the deer hunter, once he got the deer, he could do with them what he what what they liked, right? And then that language of the deer hunter being able to do whatever he likes with the deer, that language is mirrored with Mara. And it's the language of... Um, it's a, the language about failing to get free from Mara's power and control. And what I want to kind of point to with that is this. Let's let's work with well, let's work with actually sensual pleasures. It goes for all the negative stuff too, like anger and all that, but I want to do the positive in that way. So a way to think about it is is this. So if you're sitting there right, and what I'm kind of thinking about is sensual pleasures and getting delight and pleasure from things in that way. And what I'm kind of imagining, it's kind of a cartoon image in my mind, but what I'm imagining is a, a kind of Mara, like, you know, a devilish being. And it's kind of about sort of waving, waving little worldly pleasures in your face. And you kind of sitting there and then Mara waves a little sensual pleasure in your face. And you're like, ooh. And then Mara waves another sensual pleasure over here. And you're like, ooh. And pretty soon, Mara is playing you like a puppet. Because you are not in control. The sensual pleasures are in control. That is very much this idea of being under the power and control of Mara. Oh, and by the way, I, I will mention this though. I, I was I was saying this to somebody earlier, and I would like to repeat it. But it's about how it, it goes the same way with like anger, and what it is 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 that if if I were to like, you know, say a nasty thing about you, call you a name, and then you got all upset, right? And then I called you a different name. And you got all upset. There's a way in which now I'm playing you. And I can make you kind of get upset. Versus the practice of what the Buddhists call kashanti, this kind of patience. And notice that if somebody hurls an insult at you and you are patient and it doesn't get a response out of you, who's in control now? It's a very powerful place to not be swayed by sensual pleasures. And it's kind of a weak place to be under their spell in that way. And to just be like chasing them around. And in a way, to be chasing them around desperately for pleasure. And the idea of that, and you, you have all heard me talk about this before. The problem with that, of course, is that we, be, we condition ourselves to only be able to be happy or pleased once we get that thing. So our, our happiness becomes dependent upon the thing. And that's a precarious situation because in the absence of that thing, I don't know how to be happy anymore. I, it's become dependent upon that thing. So contrast that with independence. Contrast that with not needing the thing to be happy. And 
and this is sort of just to, to entice you towards meditation and the practice. But what if I, you know, what if basically what I'm getting at is, is what if rather than like, so let's say there's some sensual pleasurable thing over there and it doesn't matter what it is, right? Cause it's all subjective anyway. So what I desire might not be what you desire. So what I desire, my sensual pleasure is right over there, right? What I want you to think about is it's the idea that if I get it, there arises this sort of like joy or delight, right? But the joy or delight, which is a sort of, you know, a mental phenomena in that way, it has arisen or is dependent upon that object. But what if you could just cut out the object? What if you could just be happy? And what I mean is, is like the exact same sensation that you were going to get from the thing. What if you could just have that sensation? Well, you'll never be able to do that if you keep depending upon the thing for it. And so what I'm getting at is, is meditation is practicing being satisfied. And it's why for many, it's very difficult because we are highly addicted to sens sensual pleasures and not even, by the way, sensual pleasures, just s stimulation, just being stimulated, having a voice, you know, having the radio on so there's a voice so I don't feel lonely, all of these things. And again, my I think my point here tonight is this idea of looking at these meditations and looking at meditation as practicing not needing anything. It's practice. And the more you do it, the more you don't need things to be pleased in that way. It is truly a practice and you are actually changing your conditioning from one of dependence to one of independence. That's the transition that's going on here. And by independence, of course, I mean that you don't need anything. And when I say need, I mean the craving, the desiring, right? Of course, Buddhism still obviously talks about the nutriments, food, water, the basics. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the, you know, the sensual stimulation, Okay. Any questions about any of that? Feeling okay? All right. So then from the first jhana with our applied and sustained thought, full of rapture and bliss, we then move into this second jhana, which doesn't have applied and sustained thought. So we're in the second jhana, we are shutting the thinking internal chatter down. And we are coming to just a kind of pure observation mode with no discourse or no mental chatter. This is uh, full of self-confidence, which is very much the sentiment I was just trying to <laughs> convey. So the second jhana, you're full of self-confidence, singleness of mind, without thinking, without that looking around and investigating and all of that. And then also with rapture and pleasure, but it's a rapture and a pleasure that's not born. It's not coming from the fact that you're removed from like the craziness of the world. The second jhana, the rapture and the bliss comes from the state of single-minded concentration, that kind of focus. And then again, with the fading away of the rapture in the third jhana, we come to abide in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. We enter this third jhana. So it's not rapturously blissful. It's very pleasant, equanimous, full of, again, all of these qualities, right? Mindfulness, fully aware, 
But that's the third jhana where we still have that pleasure in that way. So what makes the fourth jhana the fourth jhana is the actual abandoning of both pleasure and pain. So we are not going for even the pleasant, nor painful, of course, but absolute kind of equanimity in that sense. And that is the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, purity and mindfulness due to equanimity. All right, so we've been here before. Let's quickly go through the next stages. So the next four meditative stages are referred to as either the formless jhanas, or they are sometimes referred to as samadhis. So I do want you to know that language, that linguistic, excuse me, that linguistic distinction. They are all called dhyana. But these next four are also called samadhis. And they are called samadhis because they are effectively a non-dual state. And by non-dual, let's kind of clarify, in the first four jhanas, they are dualistic. And they're dualistic because there is me and there's the world. And I, the meditator, have secluded myself from the world. The world's out there, but I'm in like my dojo or my wherever meditating. And then I go through these meditative states where I'm kind of disconnecting from the world in that way and being rapturously blissful due to disconnecting from the world in that way. But even in the fourth jhana, there is still this sort of me in the world, a, du a duality there where there is still the sense of me meditating. S when we move over into these next four, beginning with the, the, the base of infinite space, when they're talking about the base of infinite space, they're talking about space, period. <laughs> That's it. That's all there is. And once again, I, we don't mean outer space. We don't mean black void of space. Space is what is in between all the things. So I, I often point at my hands, the space in between my hands. Oh, look, there's space in between my fingers. I always like to point this one out. Oh, look. My finger and my palm. There is space between my finger and my palm. There has to be space, otherwise they would occupy the same space and they would be the same thing, which is called my hand. So my hand is here, but if we're talking about my fingers or the palm, there is space between them. But what I'm pointing at is that it's not this kind of space. It's a conceptual kind of space because it's the space between my fingers and my palm or the space between me and the screen. So the this, this space is here. And so, of course, what I'm pointing at is that there is space between the air molecules. There is space between me and you. There is space everywhere. Be but it's not a physical, uh, it's not a physical dimension. Space is a actually part of a mental dimension because the mind needs space to discern objects. But what I want you to think about is this. I just showed you how there is space here, space here, space here. I've even shown you how there's space here. It's almost starting to seem like there's space everywhere if you look at it the right way, which what I mean is, is that if you can, even though this band here or whatever, this band here, 
it's not spacious but it is still space because it is separating the fingers from the palm so what i'm getting at is that even though this is solid your mind can still understand it as space because it's the space between the fingers and the palms so what i'm pointing at is your mind's ability to perceive that which is solid as space and so what I'm trying to open up for you is the possibility of sort of slipping in between everything and just being in the infinite space that is everywhere anyways. If you successfully accomplished and attained such a state of infinite space, that would actually be called a samapati, an accomplishment. And that is to be in a samadhi the samadhi of infinite space. However, I just pointed out something. And what it is, is I pointed out the very, very intimate relationship between consciousness and space. I just pointed out how, I, or what I said actually was, the conscious mind uses space to distinguish objects. It, it, it needs space because as I always point out, if there was no space, these would be the same thing. I would only have one hand, but there's actually space between them. So I have two hands. So there's space and there's consciousness because consciousness is aware of space. So what I'm talking about is, is if you want to move to the second formless jhana, the conscious mind that was aware of infinite space, we now just remove the space as an idea. And so what are we left with? Infinite consciousness. But then even that, is something. And now what you should know is, is that the state of the second formless jhana of infinite consciousness, it is not you being conscious. The way the, 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 way the second formless jhana is described is that because you have removed all objects of stimulation, and because you have removed all objects of form that the mind would entertain, and you left the mind with just space, when you took the space away, there was nothing, no, there was no longer anything for consciousness to entertain. And so there's a, a residual hum of consciousness. It's not conscious of anything, but it's like, again, a residual hum that eventually subsides. And when the residual hum of consciousness subsides, there is nothing. And this is the third formless realm, the third formless samadhi of infinite, just nothing, not even space. But then there's a step further and as you may know, in the life story of the Buddha, when the Buddha was in training before he was enlightened, he learned to get into the state of infinite nothingness. Then he went to see another teacher and he learned how to get into the next one, which is the state of neither perception nor non-perception. This is a non, truly a non-dual state where we are not perceiving but not not perceiving. And the way that I understand this, and this is just me, is that it's about a type of perception that's no longer coming from the sensory organs. So the type of perception that you're used to, yeah, that's not happening anymore. But it's not that there's nothing happening, like in the third formless samadhi. So in the fourth one of neither perception nor non-perception, it's sort of like, we're not quite sure what's going on there. 
And then we have the addition of the new, because remember the Buddha learned those meditative states, even the neither perception or non-perception. And he said, no, no, that's a not enlightenment. That's not liberation. So that's where our text goes that next step to where we talk about completely surmounting the base of neither perception or non-perception and abiding in the cessation of samnya and vedana. So the cessation of perception and sensation. Samnya and vedana are two, of course, of the skandhas. And so the bhikkhu who is in this exalted state of the cessation of perception and feeling, that is escaping Mara. That is going to where Mara cannot go. And it was only upon getting to that final ninth state of the cessation of Samya and Vedana, that is when we can say the taints have been destroyed, the, the job is done, what, has, what we came here to do has been done. So anything before that, meaning any of the jhanas or any of the formless samadhis, they are temporary escapes from Mara. Meaning when you're in there, Mara can't get you. But as soon as you're back out of that meditative state, Mara is going to be there waiting. But if you can successfully bring to cessation Samya and Vedana, Mara will no longer be able to bother you, is the idea. All right. So sorry to go for going a little long. Thanks for being here. Uh, that's going to be it. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas about the bait? Awesome. Well, I hope you can all avoid the bait. And um, uh, yeah, and I'll be back next week. And I think we'll probably do another uh, sutta from the similes. So, Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for tonight. I, I do have a lot of questions, but it would take another hour. <laughs> well, but just really quick, because if the Buddha accomplished these things in before he became awake, he accomplished these things before he awakened. He was, a, you know, he practiced yoga. He practiced these samadhis and these jhanas, but then he then he woke up. Mm -hmm. So so. So it raises the question, then why it do, you know, I understand it, but it's like, yeah, but the Buddha did all of this. I'm not the Buddha, but, but I can also, but I can wake up. Mm -hmm. It's the lovely thing about it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, si se puede. Si se, yes, puede. si se puede. Yes, we can. Si se puede. <laughs> yes, but, it is possible. Thank you. All right, everybody. I hope to see you all again next Sunday. Have a beautiful night. Do you have any announcements, Michael? Just that I'll be here back next Sunday. And if you're here for the first time or new, remember we uh, you can go to to our website, SF Dharma Collective. And we uh, practiced Donna at that point, but nobody turned away for lack of funds. Thank you all so much for participating tonight. And thank you, Michael. Hmm. Thank you, Noe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you, Noe. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.